This video is sponsored by Showcase. Showcase is a network built for developers to connect, build communities, and find new job opportunities. Developers can showcase their tech stack, repositories, and projects in an optimized profile. They can find communities like JavaScript, blogging as a developer, and React, and they can use their profiles to gain access to new job opportunities. For content creators, you can make money on Showcase by turning on member subscriptions and putting your content behind a paywall. Check out the links in the description below and get started today. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Open Source Cafe and I'm super excited to present Brian here with us. Brian, first of all, thanks a lot for joining. How are you doing today? Would you like to tell our viewers a little bit more about yourself? Excellent, Kunal. Thank you very much for um, inviting me in. Actually, I found you after searching on LinkedIn and talking about my community. I just saw there's the Kunal community out there, you know, where it's like, it's not about technology, it's about you. And it's like, that's, that's not common on LinkedIn. So <laughs> I had to come and connect. But um, yeah, so uh, my name is Brian Schuster. I am a, I guess I call myself a business graduate. I graduated from school in 2010 and always wanted to be a developer, but just thought, nope, it's not going to happen. I had this idea that you you need to be young and in technology to get there. So I just kind of cut it off there. And then two things really changed that trajectory for me. One, I was working in operations for my family business. They handed me a broken data mart and three licenses to Tableau and said, we have a major loss ratio issue, fix it, you know, to go through. That started me on one path. And the other path was actually going to an event at MIT where it's like, I met a lot of entrepreneurs and people and I thought, oh, I'm going to be the business person and I'm going to find a technical person. And I got done and I was like, man, they just don't have a lot of use for young business people. I need to learn technology. So I drilled my way into the career and this was before boot camps. This was even before online courses really started taking off in mass. Um, I taught myself Python with uh, Learn Python the Hard Way by Zed Shaw. And then I just drilled deeper and deeper into the industry. I went from a business analyst to a BI writer to a data analytics developer to a cloud engineer. Till finally I got into IBM as a DevOps engineer. And I was like, oh, wow, I finally made it. Um, and, and that was a great transition. But then as I started going out, I started mentoring for boot camps. And I realized like, wow, a lot of what I did is stuff these folks need to hear. So I started just going out casually mentoring and I really got a connection with them. They liked hearing about it. I love mentoring them. And so that kind of started my Schusterian career, Schusterian Logic brand, where I now mentor folks, I do videos, I try to help people through that transition, just trying to get as many passionate people into technology as possible, because this is really one of the places people can make you know impact in mass. And so that's really what I'm about today. Yeah, and I love it when, you know, folks who have gone through that process try to give back uh, mm -hmm. thinking about like okay we were at this stage and now there were, might be other people who are at this stage so I, I really love you know supporting people who do this this kind of work so yeah most definitely and uh, thanks a lot for joining us today and of course. For, everyone, for everyone else uh, if you want to connect with uh, Brian and his YouTube channel and all these other you know, content uh, you can find the links in the description below make sure you support and make sure you check it out some pretty nice content over there but uh, today we're talking about one of the questions that i get quite a lot of times mm -hmm. so the questions i get is from mainly two sorts of people um, one are the people who are like uh, in colleges like undergrad degrees or graduate degrees like new grad roles who are just starting their career mm -hmm. and they are not from a computer science background but they want to transition into tech. They want their first role to be in tech. Some are from like the business background, some are from like literature, some are from electronics or whatever, mechanical, things like that. Even agriculture. Mm -hmm. So I, I personally believe like, you know, computer science is for everyone. The degree the thing does not really matter. You coming from a business background, now you're working in a DevOps specific yeah. role. That's why we can like, we'll talk more about that later. But if you are someone like the second type of people who reach out to me are, who already have a few years of experience, but in a different field. Mm. They're working in like marketing, working in business, they're working as a, you know, teacher or something, you know, separately different fields, and they want to transition into tech. So that's what we're going to be, you know, talking about today. So yeah, really an exciting uh, topic and definitely going to help a lot of folks. So make sure you like, share and subscribe and let's get started. Awesome. But uh, before we jump into the, you know, main part, how, I want to ask you a question that many people may ask themselves, like, how do we know that a tech career is for us. I mean, it all looks good on the outside, right? The grass <laughs> is always greener. On the other side, you get to you know, so many events and conferences. You see all these cool offices and you're working in like really big tech companies and things like that. But how does one know that a tech career is for me or what is like the pathway to find out whether the tech career is for me or not? Right. 
So um, I personally, I really like the um, Jim Collins hedgehog concept. You know, Jim Collins is an author who studied like the best businesses in the world and tried to figure out why we're overperforming companies that way. And he realized that all of these companies were operating at the center of their three basically competencies. One is what they got paid well for. What was their economic engine? What were they passionate about? Like they found, yeah, at companies, passion really matters. But then there's the what are you good at? And actually this this model works really well for people as well. You know, what can you be best at? What are you passionate about? What are you good at? Um, when I find people on whether or not they're trying to find, you know, know if they're in a tech career, like we can talk about, well, are you passionate about or do you have something that interests you in the field? And do you get, and if you get paid for it as a foregone conclusion right now, everyone gets paid for tech to do this. So that's not really a question. So really the make or break it for people I find is, do you know, can you be someone who's capable of doing the technical work? And I, I've, I've read at least some anecdotal stories of like professors who really found that like, there are really personalities who can get it versus not. Um, I, I can't think of the professor. I think it was at, they were at UC who, ba who would basically do in the beginning of their computer science course, they would administer this test where they would basically come up with a fake language, fake rules, fake ideas for some random, random language and go and test the students. And then there would be a range of competencies there, you know, top, middle, bottom of the class. Then they actually teach computer science. They would do the whole course. They would teach everyone. Then he would readminister the test at the end of the semester. What he found continually was that from the beginning of the semester to the end of the semester, nobody changed positions on that fake language or those fake languages. So there seems to be a sort of personality type that just gets computer languages. Because at the end of the day, it's just they're models. You know, that's what you get into. If you learn JavaScript, if you learn Python, C Sharp, whatever, you're being thrown a technical model and your ability for your brain to work on it is something that may not strictly be hard coded, but some people are more capable of doing than others. And so what I've found to be really useful, especially today because of how online education is that if somebody comes to me and like they have no technical background and they want to know if they're into it, just doing a course like a JavaScript course or a intro Python course is usually enough to start feeding that engine. And I've, I've given this to mentors where they weren't really sure. And I have like one example where like, you know, this lady came to me and was like, man, I am so excited for this. I want to learn this. I'm like, great, here's a Python course, go learn it. And then like six months later, we talk and she's like, nope, not for me. I don't like it. I'm going to go into product ownership or BA or something else there. And again, and that's totally okay. Yeah. And then that's totally fine. If you're oh, not yeah. into tech, then that's totally okay. Like there's tons of carriers out there. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the thing. And being, and it doesn't stop you from being tech savvy, you know, and appreciating it to go through that. That's one type of story. But another type of story is somebody goes off and do this and I'm like, man, I love this. This is great. And again, when they say they love it, it also means like the course didn't scare them away, you know, to go through. So it's like, oh, okay, maybe we should dive deeper. So maybe take a longer course, go into something that goes into more detail, get to a personal project. And people who continue to go through that and realize there's a competency there, then that's like, okay, maybe we should then be talking about a boot camp, a master's degree, you transitioning in. That's at least what I found to be a reliable indicator. Just can you do the work? Can you get through the courses? Mm. This video is sponsored by Daytree, a tool that you can use to prevent Kubernetes misconfigurations from reaching production. Using Daytree, you can catch misconfigurations in the development phase and set or create policies to receive failure alerts. It's useful for different stages of deployment and helps you measure resource usage by applying mandatory labels to workloads. 10,000 plus engineers are already using Daytree. Check out the links in the description below to get started today. Yeah, and speaking of like we're talking about uh, making your career, transitioning into careers, I mean, the inevitable thing is skills. Skills mm. are inevitable. You, you need to have those skills in whichever you know, domain you're going, be that. Mm. You know, either tech or non-tech. You, know, you you need the skills, right. and that's what we you know just talked about. Like, try it out. Try out some courses. Just try to get some hands-on experience. Open source is a great way to do that. That's Make true. projects. Go to hackathons, events, or just learn, and then you'll find yourself in a place like okay, whether if it is for me or not. And one thing that I would like to highlight over here is don't give up too early. It might be <laughs> possible that mobile development you try and it's not for you, and then you make up your mind that none of the tech fields are for me. That might not be true. Yeah, It may be true that mobile development is not for you, but web development might be interesting to you or something. So try a little bit of everything. See where you, you know, find your passion. Yeah, that's an interesting idea. And that was something that um, 
haven't really fleshed out, but I know it was a big struggle with me because I kept wanting to come back to it. And I would go like, I would do like the easy courses online. Like, um, oh God, what was it? It's like coder camp. I can't think of the name of it, but it was like, it was a JavaScript course. It was all in the, in the, in the, um, the browser. I would take it, but nothing really stuck. Right. And so it wasn't that I got the sense that I was bad at it. It just was that the learning never really transmitted into something that felt real. That's why I, whenever I tell the story, I talk about Zed Shaw's Learn Python the Hard Way, because to me, that made it stick. I spent two hours really getting away from being in the browser and downloading something on the computer, having to deal with the command line. That made it real. And that, so there is an activation energy that is really required to get through that, which is why boot camps can be so useful to get through that hurdle, because you can self-teach after a certain point. You can learn steadily, but there's sometimes the activation energy is so big you kind of need to be hurdled up through it. Either somebody needs to pull you up or you need to grow into that position. You, you need to go through. In my case, I, <laughs> I I scaled the wall myself, you know? But yeah, you're right. If you, you don't want to give up too early, like you can try different disciplines or different different methods of learning. Same subject as a different method and that may stick. So I agree. You want to try it until you know, yeah, yeah. This, this isn't going to happen. Yeah. Cool. And now let's talk about the, the you know, the problem at hand that in the questions at hand that we got, like... Uh, Speaking of new grads first, right? Mm -hmm. Just out, you're just out of college. You have some experiences or whatever. You may not have any experiences, things like that. What is like the best way, or is it is there a best way uh, to approach like the job hunting part? Like when you were looking for your first role in tech, how how did you approach that? Yeah, I, I guess the thing I should mention is that um, for experienced folks and new grads, there's there's different strategies to go about the, the work just based on your strengths. The biggest thing that a new graduate has that you know other folks in the market don't have, particularly the experienced folks, is that they have a lot of time in the market and they're very moldable to particular positions. Like if you go and hire somebody who's, you know, like in their mid thirties and they're going into a career, one is that they're smart enough to know, you know, they spend enough time in the market to be quite savvy with their career. So career transition, salary negotiations, they all know that. So they're not, not more difficult. It's just, they're on a path and you just kind of have to accept them the way they're less flexible versus somebody new. It's like, you have no new experience, but you have so much time. I can mold you to a position. So I know places that love hiring only new grads because they want to teach them their way. Like um, my wife worked for Deloitte, you know, there, and they love hiring new grads because as a Deloitte hire, there's a particular way they want to mold you. There's a particular way you want to think, and you are a blank slate. So you want them, so you're happy to come in there. So one of the things you want to do is you want to get, take advantage of the career services in your, or, you know, in your, in your, um, in your university, you want to see where you already have the connections. You want to see what is already available and you don't want to sleep on those because they've said, we know you don't have experience, but we've accepted that as part of the bill. That's part of the deal. So go take advantage of those. Um, if you are like, for example, if you are at new uh, NC state, um, in, 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 you know, Raleigh, North Carolina, you have inroads into my organization, IBM. You have internships. You have great opportunities just because there's so many state grads. That is effectively closed even for people out of Duke and UNC. That's a pathway that's open to them. So just showing that, so showing the soft skills there because they know they don't, you don't have the hard skills. You need to, you need to pass the basic coding test, right? Hacker rank there. But you're not going to expect to have experiential knowledge. You're expected to be quite green. As long as you're showing you're hungry, you want to learn, and you're what about that company, you'll tend to do better. So that's the thing. Use these connections you already have and just show passion and interest in the direction you're going. And I find that works quite well for folks in that position. Yeah. And speaking of that, like I think what we're trying to say is in, if you talk about what to expect, so like having an open mind is key. Right, because yeah. you, you will be molded into the role that you've been provided, and that's what I've been seeing. Like now, I graduate next year, but the mm -hmm. way I work, it's it's like one person is doing like so many nice, amazing things, and according to my role, I get to learn so many things. It's not like okay, yeah. I I don't know about this thing, so this is this is the end of the road for me. No, right. if you don't know, you you learn. The company is going to help in the in your training or whatever that might be. Right. Different company deals deals with it in a different way, but yeah, that's sort of like the uh, you have a lot of time on your hand as a new grad. I really, really love that point. Yeah. Right, and that's the part that 
I, I think new grads really need to understand where it's like they know they are training you. That's why they are hiring you in a lot of cases, because they know you can be grown, you can be molded, mm -hmm. you can be changed. So, yeah, I mean, that's why the soft skills are so important, because they want somebody that's going to go and grow. And they know you're not going to be up to speed for a few years. They get that. Mm -hmm. They understand mm -hmm. that. So as long as you're just willing to take the time to understand the role, really understand the technology and keep learning, you're not going to really run into like the really hard the really hard requirements, not like the mid-level people will run into where mm -hmm. there's like, it can make or break it. You can fumble a little bit at the beginning and it's okay. As long as you keep making steady progress, people will be willing to work with you. And then eventually you'll just take off and now you're in the company, you know? So that's, mm -hmm. yeah, just don't worry too much about getting fired. Just stay in the role and do what you need. <laughs> do yeah. what they and ask you, you to. Yeah. <laughs> if you get stuck, like ask questions and stuff, just be yeah. honest and transparent. Yeah. Cool. And so we talked about like getting the opportunity. So obviously like work hard, first of all, according, according to your skills, see what you're interested in, try mm -hmm. out these things and network with people, go to events, so many you know, ways. And I've already made like tons of videos on this, like how to network and how to get opportunities and all these other things. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, so that's good. And off campus is a great route as well. I know, if you get companies in your college, that's great. But in mm. case you don't, like my college, no companies come. So mm -hmm. I went the off-campus route. So like networking with people, let's say at KubeCon and stuff, you know, they, at KubeCon, they have a job board and all yeah. and these things. So you can try that out and things like that. Cool. Yeah. Uh, let's move forward with like, okay, you mentioned now you're in the company, right? You're, you're just starting out, you're learning, whatever they're sharing with you, you're doing stuff. So the question at hand is now, as a new grad, one of the things that, and correct me if I'm wrong, like, Obviously, what people are looking for as a new grad is experience. Right? You're just starting your first role. Right. So that's great. You have a job. But this, these are the years where you build yourself. These mm -hmm. are the years where you get those experience and things like that. So what is like, what are your suggestions or tips or anything you would like to highlight in terms of how do we grow in a company when we're like just starting out? What are some right. of the best practices? All right. I'm actually dealing with this because I have a number of new hires that I'm doing or people who are very early on in their career going through this experience. And honestly, as an engineering manager for these folks, my expectation early on is just, just participate in the process that you've been given. And there's a lot of simple stuff like that. Like you'd be amazed at how many people just don't show up to meetings like one on ones or don't show up to required, you know, stand ups or, you know, or like you know, the the you know the stand-ups and the the backlog grooming even people who've been there for a while and there's there's sometimes there's personality conflict sometimes there's mismatches so like an, an engaged early hire will just go to those events and we'll just we'll be engaging in the process they'll be talking to their product their, their, in our standards like means talking to your iteration manager using your wall of work pulling stories in basically just go through the process. We're going to hold your hand 90% of the way. Just go ahead and do that process and you'll do well inside of the role itself. So that's that's specific to your role. If you just do that, most of the time, we don't even have an idea of what you're doing next. Like we'll have an idea of where to go, but I, at least I know where it's like, we don't know who this person is yet. We don't know where their skill set are. We have an inclination. And so we're going to throw learning and challenges, but it's not so hard as to like knock them down, you know, you know at least not at the beginning in a in a well-defined system that, that shouldn't be the case but that's really the first step just do your role do what you're told and you're you're doing well the second thing is to um i, I guess it's it's patience really in the early career and this is hard because because i'm not saying sit and do nothing because again you should be out in your career doing that but there's all that but especially when you're new you're learning how to work inside of a large company. And particularly for, I know what they said this about millennials, they're saying about this next generation, they kind of expect to be able to go up the ranks very, very quickly. They don't understand that you kind of have to be let up the route, you, you know, the route, and all that's the case. And I guess I'm not saying you have to be fully accepting of that. I mean, if you want to move fast, there is a methodology to do it and likely not inside of the business. But like expecting your boss to go from somebody who promotes people once every two to four years to being someone who promotes them in six months without you showing that you've gotten to the next level is a big something that's not going to help you. Like inside of our organization, we have very clear boundaries of what it means to be. This is an early hire. This is a band seven, band eight, band nine. And what I'll find early hires make mistakes with is they'll have their own internal standard of what they think a good developer looks like and what their own standard is. And they won't consider the standard that's been given in front of them. And they won't be curious about it. And then just one day they'll decide, I'm good enough. 
and they're not hiring me. So that, that, that sucks, you know, that I, I'm not being given something. So like, I would say patience and understanding the system you're in is good. If you don't like it, it's like, great. You can go to another company. You can find that yourself. I mean, I know a guy, um, uh, Bennett, who is just in a, one of the most passionate developers I've ever met early in a career. He was in college, but he went to a boot camp at the same time. He's got three AWS certifications. He's going to AWS to go through now. And now he's like, he saw that system. He's trying to grow fast and he hasn't been able to quite do it after six months. They said, oh, I want to go faster. So he's taking that route. He's not upset at the company. He's not expecting his boss. You need to change for me. He's just saying, okay, fine. I know I need to be playing a different game and it's, it's working quite well for him. So not understanding the game you're in is a big part of it. And that that's hard to learn. Like, you know, the, the, the machine's going to seem amorphous and, and there's also going to be like bad decisions thrown in the a, a side tangent here. Like, look, don't get me wrong. Like you need to understand the machine, but if you don't understand the machine, you can't understand what a good decision or a bad decision is. Some people say, I'm not getting the outcome I want. It's a bad decision. So like, that's the case there. And you may ultimately be right. Um, but the truth is, is that if you don't understand how the system works, it may be a good decision and you have no clue, you know, it may be the right decision, decision to make that sense. So that's the thing, like you, you need to understand the machine. And once you understand the machine, you can go and say, okay, I understand it. And it's still a shitty decision that's being made here. So I don't want to be a part of it, or I need to be for, you know, enforcing change, or I need to be influencing that that's part of it there, but just don't automatically assume because you're not going fast enough that something's going wrong that maybe hmm. it's going right and you're just not part of the main plan in which case you yeah. can you can change yeah thanks brian that was that was great uh lots of great insights but uh talk about like you know shifting companies and things like that and we often see people after two years or three mm -hmm. years they change their roles they move on to better roles or whatever so how, how does one decide when that time has come I, it really, it's 100% decided by the individual how fast you're moving and the opportunities you're given right in front of you. Um, I, I mean, so for me, um, I don't have a robust answer, but I have a personal answer. I know what happened there. Like one is just, you can't stand the company anymore. You can't stand being in this position. Like I found out a long time ago, um, not even at the role, but there, there was a role I did with a terrible company that I was working for. And, uh, you know, I still talk to the people who work there with me. And every time we talk about it was just, it was just not a good experience. And like, I couldn't figure out why I hated the role, but like it, it I, I couldn't explain it. Eventually I was just like, I got to get out of here. So I just left the job sight on scene, didn't have another opportunity and just left. Took me about a couple of months to finally realize where it's like the company made me feel this small. I was killing myself to bring out these features and development, but like they just wanted to someone to sit in a cubicle and be happy with what they went through. But it's like, I want to be needed. I want to be liked. I want to be a part of that. And that's something I really need out of the organization. And it just can provide that. Now I could give my reasons why they needed to change and, or why else there, but at the end of the day, it's like, it just wasn't a good match. So me leaving was a good idea. And I went to a company that appreciated me quite a bit. So it's like, Hey, that was a good meet. So personal reasons is another area. The second, and this is like the biggest reason why is that, you, you've stopped growing. And this is, this is, this is going to take time to figure out exactly what that means. But really it's like you get into a role because at the end of the day, a company is not there primarily for you to grow. You are supporting a business and the business is supporting a market. So if you're somebody who does your job day in and day out and just, you know, it's not moving, the company will hire you there. You know, there's certain cultures that are up or at, up and out, but most aren't. So you can sit in that role and do that. But the people that I see who want to improve in a career, want to move into different areas, will notice this point where it's like, I'm doing the same thing month, day in and day out. I'm not growing my skills. This is going nowhere. I want to be there. I need to either get moved to a different role internally, or I need to find another job. And that's the thing, like your best opportunities are always going to be at the company you're at currently. You're going to know you're, you're going to have a market, you're going to have a network there. And if you make a case to say, I want to grow, you would, a manager would have to be dumb not to try to accommodate you, you know, to go through that. Like I, I've seen that happen. Like there are, there are many really bad managers out there. So maybe they don't do, maybe they won't do that, but you should always start with that avenue to say, look, I want to move into this area or this direction. And then they can come back and say no, in which case, you know, Okay, time for me to move on. Time for me to find that next area. But that's the one that you, you go you go where it's they're either not moving fast enough for my taste. I think I can get a better deal elsewhere, and then you just move on. Um, as a practical example, as a practical rule of thumb, 
12 to 18 months is the minimum you want to stay in a role. Um, and I, I can say that from an engineering manager perspective, unless you have a good reason you were recruited away, you left because of some serious mismanagement. Like you do not have to explain why you left after 12 to 18 months. You'll have to explain why you left after four to six months, because if I don't have a good answer, I'm going to think you got fired. They didn't appreciate, you know, you, you got fired or personality issues or something. So that looks weird. But after 18 months to two years, you said, hey, I learned the role. I did everything I could with it. Now it's time for me to move on. Good enough. You know, so that's it's a good, good, good word of wisdom for your young grads. This video is sponsored by Teleport, enabling engineers to quickly unify access to any computing resource anywhere on the planet. Check out the links in the description below to get started. Are you juggling with shared secrets, SSH keys, or hopping between VPNs and multiple access points? Check out Teleport to quickly access your computing resources from anywhere. Teleport allows engineers and security professionals to unify access for SSH servers, Kubernetes clusters, web applications, and databases across all environments. With a unified resource catalog, there is no need to maintain inventories. You can also work together to troubleshoot a problem with your colleagues on a remote server or on each other's laptops and record these sessions as well using shared sessions. Teleport also provides ready-to-use auth for your internal web applications. Easily implement security and compliance with Teleport to adopt industry best practices for access across all protocols and all environments with minimal configuration. How does it work? Teleport is a single binary which enables secure access to SSH nodes, Kubernetes clusters, web apps, and databases. Deployed as a single binary, it seamlessly integrates with the rest of your stack. Get started with Teleport now and try it for free. Check out the links in the description below for more information. Yeah, and it's it's like yeah, like you you mentioned it's personal. Like it's like dependent yeah. on person to person and the situation. Cool. Well, that was it about new grads, and I, I hope you all got some you know nice uh, insights. But uh, let's talk a little bit more about now the experienced folks yes. who have who already have a few years of experience, but not in tech, right? And they want right. to transition into tech. So, how does that career change happen? Like into tech, what is like the first thing they need to do? What is like I mean, the framework for it? Yeah. yeah, right. So really the first phase here is kind of the exploration. And everyone has, a. have met a lot of people who have really good stories um, of the direction they're going through. And like the first decision there is kind of deciding like, I can't, I can't make this work. My, I'm in a dead end career. I'm a trucker. I'm in services and I want to move elsewhere. And you kind of have to, you have to commit to a fair degree to a direction there. And I'm not talking about the early exploratory phase. There's a phase where it's like, oh, I want to move into development, but that could mean a lot of things, cybersecurity, full stack development, data analytics, even something exotic like blockchain could even have options for you. Um, and you get early exploratory, but you really haven't started the process until you've said, okay, I need to commit to one of these and I need to see it through to a full experience. I need to do something to get me set into the industry. And it needs to be more than just I taken a course or even taken a boot camp to get through, you know, this experience. Like what you need to be able to show to make the career transition is that you've committed to this field, you're learning it, you have some special combination of your current skills and your past experience that make you interesting to go higher. And I'll get to that in a minute. But also that you can actually do the work. I mean, this is the, the biggest thing that most people making career transition don't have, which is they need to be able to show demonstrable skills behind what they're saying they can do. You cannot get around that. Um, most people are not, are not, you know, most jobs are not so, you know, strung up for entry level talent, particularly for career changers, that a boot camp and project work alone will get you into the transition. Don't get me wrong, it works for some people, but they're already showing extraordinary talent in the boot camp. They've already done networking, they've already got an accolade. So people are like, yeah, you you deserve to be over here. Someone get pulled out. But most people, they need to go the extra step to say, you need to be contributing to an open source project. You need to show you've spent time with a startup and actually help build project. You need to show freelance work. You need to show that you've worked on some product to deliver this to give the to give the companies you're hiring for more of an more of a commit to show that you've put skin in the game. You've gone out to get the experience to show, yes, I belong in this field and I deserve a chance there. And that's really all the framework is there. It's to try and destruct us to figure out how do you find skills, how do you find your gaps, how do you get the education and networking. How do you find the opportunity? And then how do you sell that after it's done? Like, what's the end point of that? Because there's some places where you're going a good way and but it doesn't matter for anything. But there's some ways you do it where it ends up being incredibly transformative and it's something that you mm. can go and sell. So um, 
I, I guess when it comes to, I guess this framework, that's, that's a, that's a big key behind it. Just getting down to those demonstrable skills. Yeah. Yeah. And that's like, like we mentioned earlier, like skills, like if you're living for a role should be having those skills. And I think like when you have already, when you already have like a few years of experience and then you want to transition into a tech role, I think most people, what they're looking for is credibility. Right. Like, like if, if you get the role, would you be able to like do it? Like you, you're transitioning from a different career. And in that case, yeah, like, like you mentioned open source, your freelance work or projects, all these things come into picture. And that also ties in very well with how to find opportunities because if you're working in open, if you're learning in public and things like that, you, you will find people who you know might have seen your work in open source or mm -hmm. something like that. And they would refer you if there was, they would be like an opening position or something. So what are your thoughts on this? Like how do we actually approach the job market when you already have a few years of experience? Right. And so um, a few years of experience in tech or a few years just in a professional environment? In a professional environment, oh, right. non-tech. Right, right. And so, I, I mean, I guess this is the part where I think I need to do I need to do more work here because my framework is very general, but like based on the discipline, it could be a very different path. Like for example, personal projects for full stack development, I find they can be useful, but they don't really sell. Like I find that like struggling with a project and a difficult client does way, way more to sell you than, than, um, you know, than just a personal project. However, personal projects for data analytics can be very informative, particularly if it's a deep research realm. Like if you go in and say, I was interested in this field. So I'm going, so I went out and grabbed weather data for the last 10 years. I put it into a cluster. I analyzed it. Here's the reports. Here's the data there. That ends up being very compelling. Like I've, I've been in, you know, I've seen portfolios that make me yawn, even though they're, they're nice, they look good, but the, for a data analytics research project or machine learning, I go and say, that's, that's good stuff. That's stuff I want to I be involved in. So it's very um, domain specific, but generally speaking, the way you find these opportunities is that one, you have to commit. And when I say commit, it's not, the important part isn't committing to one field. The important part is saying no to everything else. I see people who are like, man, I want to be a game developer in full stack and I don't know. And it's like, that's great. The whole point of this framework here is to tie you in for a period of time, not forever, three months, six months, whatever it is, to get you a demonstrable skill set in this area. So like game dev or full stack, we can do either one, but you have to say no to the other thing to go into that. And then it's really just about learning the industry, learning what matters. Because as I said here, full stack and data analytics have different fields, but even within data analytics, there's <laughs> there's different levels there. There's gonna be different opportunities. There's different chances to interact with the market. And part of it is that you want to find the right education. You wanna find your network. You wanna find where these people are and you want to get embedded with those folks. You wanna have people you can talk with. You wanna figure out who the thought leaders are. You wanna figure out who has good information. And then you kinda of wanna continually update what that education is. Maybe you thought education A was useful, but really this other learning was really helpful. Being embedded in the industry really helps, helps to uh, solidify that. But that just helps from knowing what education is out there and knowing where to look for opportunities. Really selling the opportunities and then doing the same sales technique you would do for a full-time job, but at a smaller level. I mean, this is the part that's for, especially for people who are not getting paid to work, they don't really understand this. Even though you're going out and you're not getting paid as much or you're open on open source, you still got to sell them on the fact that you're worth dealing with your time. Because even, even though you might work in open source, they still have to look at your PRs. They still have to get time. So they want to know you're a player. The standard is lower, but there is a standard. So everything you should be doing should be saying, I'm learning this field, I'm committed to this. And if you give me a chance on this project for one month, two months, or it's an open source project and you should accept me into community, somebody should look at you and go and say, yeah, we're willing to take a chance on you and be able to build that so that you can build those demonstrable skills. Hmm. And if you can get someone small to say yes to you and you complete that project, that starts to build that virtuous cycle up to get bigger and bigger fish, you know? And that can look like, going from a, working for a startup for three months, doing a good job, and then having them contract out for you in the future. You know, that, that might be one world. Go from open source and you might become one of their key contributors. Uh, going, doing freelance work and making that a big part of your work. There's lots of ways to get embedded, but that's where you start building up your resume. You get specific line items to say, I can tell a story about this. I can show this skill that I've done. I can build this. And then when you're ready, you go through one or two of those cycles. You go through and say, okay, now I'm ready for the full-time job. I'm ready to go out and commit to 
this bigger thing I wasn't able to get before because now you can tell the stories. Now other people can say, yeah, I've worked with Brian and he ends up, he, he did a great job. He showed what he did there. And that makes it easier for the company to commit to you. Um, and I guess I got another point I want to make here about what exactly are they hiring with experienced folks? So the benefit of new graduates is that new graduates are new, they're moldable, and they're early in their career. So if they stay with your company, there's a long trajectory of how long they can stay there. Experienced folks, just because of time, don't have the longevity that the young folks do. They're not as moldable. So they can't they can't beat the new folks on that. This is why people moving into experienced roles rarely get apprenticeships. They rarely get internships. They rarely get the new, you know, even entry level jobs, those are kind of reserved for new folks. I'm not saying it's impossible. I've just never seen anyone be successful. But these experienced folks have been very successful at getting mid level jobs. Most of the boot camp graduates I know that have successfully transitioned into the career have done so at the associate level. The way mm -hmm. they were able to do that was by showing that in addition to their technical skills, which were good enough for what they've dealt with to what, what they need to do, but they have professional breadth. I, I'll give you a perfect example here. I hired a boot camp graduate and a band, you know, an entry level graduate, one guy out of college, one guy who's been in the workforce for 10 years, just learning. From a technical perspective, they were about the same level of experience, right? But at the end of the quarter, we had an issue where somebody left and all of a sudden everything kind of went into, like we went into emergency mode there. And, you know, I had to decide, am I going to rely on this new guy to go and help me with this issue or go to the professional hire? To the new guy, I said, don't worry, don't pay attention. We got you. You know, We'll, we'll handle this. Just keep doing on your path. To the professional hire who had just as much technical experience, I went to him and said, hey, we got this issue. I'm going to throw this problem at you. You cool? And he's like, yeah, I got it. That's the benefit of a professional hire, because even though they don't have the technical experience, but they're learning, they understand bullshit happens. Like, you know, my, my, my new guy might have went through and see that and like, I don't know, is he going to freak out? Is he going to panic? He's never dealt with this before there versus the new guy. It's like, yeah, kind of same shit, different day, you know? <laughs> so he understood it. So like, that's the sort of framework that ends up being really useful. Your broad experience and your ability to be in a professional environment sells you there. And it makes it more likely to say, yeah, you don't have the technical experience, but you'll learn, but you have all these other good things that I want to, to teach, you know, that you can bring to the team. So that's why we're willing to accept you. That's been a really powerful format for um, experienced hires to get into jobs. And that's a really interesting point and some you know, great insights from your experiences as well. One thing I would like to add on to that is just mm -hmm. you know, the learn the learning should never stop even when you are in a role and you're you, you will find it yourself like even at least I know in tech the learning like continues with so many new frameworks coming out and tools and in the cloud native there's so many projects and your competitors you'll be uh, you know looking for forward to them and right. it's just like yeah the learning the learning is key cool right. and just yeah just one last thing I want to mention is something both new grads and you know, someone who is transitioning into the career may struggle from is imposter syndrome. So what are your you know, thoughts about dealing with imposter syndrome? So I, I guess my first thought here, now that I'm actually have dealt with it and seen the consequences of it is you have to deal with the dragon. <laughs> like you have to go through it. Like I, I, I've, I'm, I, I've seen someone like practically self-destruct because of imposter syndrome. Um, and we know it's imposter syndrome because like, you know, this individual has the technical skills to do what they do. Like we look at them and say, you have the technical skills. There's no gap here. You have no additional, because if somebody's floundering, you can think of, okay, is it, it, it they have a communication issues or their skills? We look through, no, no, no. It's, it's a confidence issue. It's imposter syndrome. So like, if you have this, and this is really something that gives you a lot of nerves, like you're going to be nervous for a period of time. That's fine. It's if the nerves end up impacting your work that you're like, okay, I got I, I got to deal with this dragon because this is becoming something big. What I found is that one, just un giving yourself the space and time to really recognize this and deal with it is, is really key. Like, you know, some people will be nervous and that they, they, that because of that, they don't go through and do option A, B, C, they, they'll avoid those situations. And honestly, early on, that's not really a good place. Like, so I guess my first piece of advice is give yourself the time to actually really think about this, go through this and recognize that it's happening. If you can't point it out, it may, you know, because this is such a personal thing, it'll appear to be a problem like with work or you'll, you're say you're not educated enough when in fact it's a confidence issue. So really understanding that you're actually dealing with it is really key. The second thing is that I like to rely on habits 
to get through the really difficult parts of imposter syndrome or just the fear. Like if you have to go through and your animal brain is just screaming, get out. I don't want to deal with this because they're, you're, you're nervous or whatever. You're not going to be operating at a high level. But if you use, you know, you, your habits and actually really frame out like, okay, I'm going to go in, I'm going to do this, then I'm going to do this, then I'm going to do this, then I'm going to push and I'm not going to think about it. I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to follow this checklist. Your animal brain may be screaming, but your body is able to work your way through, through that problem. They're able to work their way through that issue. So if you know, and, and, on, and you'll find patterns in your job. When you first start, it takes some time, but you'll find patterns to be like, what's the pull request process look like? How do I actually release a feature to production? How do I go and, you know, what is my expectation for giving a presentation? You can learn those things. You'll find the one, two, three elements where you know your imposter syndrome is getting in the way. You can structure those out, give yourself an idea, and just know you can get through it. You get your body screaming, you're internally going, ah, I can't do this. And then, you, nope, nope, we're just going to do the list and get through. Proving yourself you can do that means that you can deal with the pain and fear and go through that. That's another great way to deal, you know, to, to deal with that pain. And then I think the way you deal with it continually is once you get over it, like we call it imposter syndrome, but it's really, it's really just fear. That, that's really what it is. I'm going to get caught. I'm going to go through there. And you're going to deal with that over and over again. The best way I have found personally is combine habits and really continue to push that and do it before it's actually needed. <laughs> you know, like you said, continually learn. And um, I, I like the, the way I'm trying to structure this micro experience framework is so that you can pick new skills, you identify a skill set and go through it again and again and again. And as you start to switch domains, you're going to feel that fear all over again. I mean, last year I decided to pick up game development and then I switched to 3D modeling because I just I love the field and I ended up enjoying it. And I realized where it's like, God, guess what? I am a scrub again. <laughs> I'm not this <laughs> badass developer. I'm not an expert here. I just don't know what I'm doing. So I had to sit down and really think, how am I going to express this? How I'm going to put ideas. And to me, like the hard part was like sharing it with the world, like putting out a model, sharing it on my LinkedIn. So I'm like, OK, well, I have to deal with this. And I found mm -hmm. that even though I was afraid of it, I had the tools to deal with it because I've done this so many times. I know how to get through this. So I guess you should understand that you're going to be living with this for the rest of your life. It's just a name, a new name for something very old. And the sooner you're able to go through and face that dragon, the easier your mm. life will be long term. That's my advice. Yep. Yeah, you can take it as a learning opportunity. Imposter syndrome yeah. does not mean that you don't know you don't know anything. It just means like you know Brian mentioned, like you know something else, and now you're working on something else. So right. It's, it's, more dependent on like what 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 is it that you're currently doing it does not mean that you don't know anything exactly. but yeah that feeling you know even if you try you you get that feeling but some great points shared about how to deal with it well thanks a lot for joining brian that was, uh, that was great and uh, thanks everyone else for watching as well um to connect with brian and his channel and you know the content he posts i'll leave all the links in the description so make sure you check it out you learn even more over there and uh, yeah once again thanks a lot brian for joining and uh, we'll see you all in the next one Bye. Thank you so much.